All right. So today is our pleasure to have with us uh, Alyssa Pearson. She's an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at Boston University, and her research interests include the trust and cooperation in multi-agent systems, distributed robotics control, and socially compliant autonomous system design. She focuses on designing robotic systems that interact with humans and other robots in complex dynamic environments. Prior to joining BU, Professor Pearson was a research scientist with the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT. She received her PhD degree from Boston University in 2017 and the Bachelor in Engineering from Harvey Mudd College. During her PhD, she was awarded the Claire Booth Lucha Fellowship. She was the best paper finalist at the 2016 International Conference on Robotics and Automation an honorable mention for the 2022 IEEE Transaction on Robotics King Su Fu Memorial Award and a recipient of the NSF Career Award in 2023 and received the inaugural Mass Robotics Rising Star Award in 2023. So I think with no further ado, we're very looking forward to hearing uh, what you're going to tell us today. I think the stage is yours. Uh, uh, thank you for that. That kind introduction. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Alyssa and today I'm going to talk about uh, semi-cooperative multi-agent interactions in cluttered environments. And so I want to start by talking about some of the motivation or, or things that you know I'd, I'd really love to eventually bring to robotics. And um, what I have here is a video from uh, BBC's Blue Planet 2 documentaries. And this is of uh, seals hunting tuna in the Galapagos Islands. Now, in this video, uh, it turns out these seals in open water uh, are, are not as fast as the tuna. So in open water, the tuna can always swim faster and get away. Um, so what the seal do is they cooperate in teams and actually hunt in teams to push these tuna into different kind of tidal pools and, and basins where they can then trap and corner the different fish and more successfully hunt as a team. And when I look at this, my, you know, my life goals are not to build robotic seals. Uh, that would be very cool, but that's not my main area of research. But what I'm really inspired by here is how we have this cooperation between the teams. We've got really nuanced interactions, complex environments with you know, a lot of rich topological features and very different types of agents. And really across nature, we see a lot of interesting interactions between different types of animals at different types of scales. From things like herding dynamics uh, between sheep and sheepdogs, the fact that we see ants that are capable of building these collective bridges to move uh, between areas, the things like uh, dolphins and whales hunting in, in bait balls, and the seal example uh, that we just saw in the video. And really, when I see this, I wonder how can we get robots to exhibit the same kinds of rich and complex behavior that we see in nature? And while this may sound like this is going to be a bio-inspired talk, I'll quickly move away from a lot of bio-inspiration, uh, but underpinning a lot of my research is this idea that we want to move towards richer, more complex behavioral models for our robots. Sometimes this is looking at interactions in nature, and sometimes this is going to be developing new types of cooperation models um, for, for our robots. And I want to step back and say that uh, this idea of bio-inspired robotic herding or taking these bio-inspired cooperation systems is not new to the field. And some of the first experiments in automatic flock control actually came out of Oxford about 25 years ago, uh, led primarily by uh, Dr. Richard Vaughn, where they used a robot to herd a, a flock of ducks through through this pin to get them from, from one location to another. And a lot of advances also in the image processing and um, computer vision side of things to detect the flock for the robot and determine how to exploit different flocking dynamics 
um, to move them through the environment. And we can do that by taking these flocking models of our agents and look at the different flocking models that we have for the agents and start to exploit this notion that animals will run away from perceived threats. And then we can start to build this exploitation of controllers where we can have agents that take advantage of known phenomenon and get different types of cooperative herding behavior. So this was some of my work for my PhD where we looked at uh, taking this idea of bio-inspired herding and turning it into a multi-robot um, herding dynamic where we can use geometric properties to position the agents around um, around the, the flock and drive them to, to goal locations. Uh, but largely in this system, while it might be non-cooperative, we're still assuming everyone is maybe playing by the rules or taking advantage of one particular phenomenon that we can exploit. And we also see this too sometimes when we study pursuer evader games, where a lot of times when we look at uh, pursuer evader games, we can maybe guarantee capture of all evaders, and we can guarantee that our agents, um, in this case, the pursuers are the black triangles, the evaders are the red circles. We can use geometric properties of the environment to capture all of our evaders, but there's this notion that everyone is playing by the rules and that we set up a lot of rules about our game uh, in order to ensure that we win the game. And what I wanna look at going forward is how can we start to relax some of those assumptions on the rules that we need in order for uh, a guarantee of things to succeed. And coming back to the big picture, really our model of behavior is going to drive our ability to enable these rich and complex interactions. So it's going to take more complex models of cooperation, more complex models of interagent dynamics in order to build these richer systems. And instead of thinking of our agents and our team as either being all cooperative with equal performance on one end of a spectrum or explicitly malicious agents on another end of the spectrum, we wanna think about all those types of interactions and dynamics in between. So how do we design teams with performance variations, with uncertainty, non-cooperative teammates, and human teammates? And so that's uh, those are generally the types of research problems that I'm, I'm very interested in. And so today I'm going to talk about a few ways in which we're starting to model behavior between teams to get more complex interactions. And I wanna step back and say that uh, one way I like to think about it is I like to think about some approaches to modeling behavior. And um, generally, I categorize this as three approaches to modeling behavior. And this is uh, what I like to define as geometric, interactive, and learned. So geometric policies, these might be things like our reciprocal velocity obstacles, uh, using properties of Voronoi cells, reachability, control barrier functions. They often are very fast to compute and they bound our interactions to specific regions, either in the environment or the configuration space. We also have interactive models of cooperation and these take the form of maybe a game theoretic design of our control and behavior. And they do start to exhibit more complex behavior than purely geometric and reactive policies. Um, and so we can predict different types of behaviors through some, some optimization. And finally, there's of course, uh, learned policies of behavior where given sufficient training data, we can go ahead and find the emergent behavior that's happening without explicitly writing out um, those policies. And this is a really useful technique for capturing nuances and in interactions or finding kind of underlying heuristics or, or primitives um, between those policies. And so each of these approaches to modeling behavior has their strengths and weaknesses in the different domains in which you might be, be looking to search. Geometric policies are really nice. They can be safety nets uh, for your agent. 
they're often very fast to compute and they bound your actions to a region. So as long as you know that everyone's playing by these geometric policies, they can often be very fast and very scalable. Interactive approaches do give you more complex behavior uh, at the cost of more computation and more optimization, um, but you're going to get this uh, game theoretic prediction of behaviors, um, more complex nuances between the agents that you wouldn't necessarily get with an immediate geometric policy. And finally, as I discussed, those, those learned policies also give you even more nuances, even more emergent behavior on a specific domain, um, assuming you have sufficient data. And while I'll say that uh, within this talk, I'm going to focus primarily on uh, some, some of our work in geometric and interactive modeling of, of agent behaviors. And I will uh, say that we won't really discuss learned behaviors. And so today I'm going to talk about three um, different problems that we're working on uh, within, within our lab. And uh, these three problems, so the first I'll talk about some work in heterogeneous multi-robot resource delivery. And so we're looking at, again, geometric coverage-based coverage -based policies where the different robots have different abilities. And we're trying to get them to coordinate as a team um, for this resource delivery task. I'll next talk about scaling up stochastic dynamic games, where we take an interactive game theoretic model in belief space and look at how agents can plan behavior when they're trying to predict what another agent is thinking, who is also predicting what they're trying to do. And I'll first present some of our, our work on stochastic dynamic games and then some newer work in where we're really trying to scale up to more agents, more interactions through this idea of selective negotiations. Um, so how can we maybe make this more computationally efficient or more scalable if our agent doesn't need to negotiate with everyone at all points in time? And then finally, I'll talk about some of our work uh, on social behaviors for autonomous vehicles or thinking about new types of cooperation models from social psychology and how they can apply to domains such as autonomous driving. So first I wanna talk about heterogeneous multi-robot resource delivery. And as a problem overview, what we have is a general problem where we have this team of robots that needs to deliver resources throughout some region. And the demand for those resources is going to vary uh, over the location. So it's got some spatial variation and those that demand can also evolve over time. So the demand can evolve through injection of new demand, it can evolve through the physical location of the demand changing, and it'll also change based on what supplies have been delivered by the robots. And every robot in our team is going to have a different supply capacity. So it becomes this challenge of how do we assign robots, given their supplies, given what supplies they have, to the specific resources that are needed throughout the environment. And I want to give uh, one example of where this might be applicable. Um, so what types of resources might this be used for? Why might we want robots to work as a team for kind of this large scale uh, resource delivery problem? And this is something that uh, maybe if you're in the US, you might be more familiar with. Uh, but it turns out in the US, uh, there's this massive campaign to deliver rabies vaccines to raccoons and other wild animals. So worldwide, rabies kills approximately 59,000 people annually. And within the, the continental US, the most common carriers now are wild animals. So things like foxes, squirrel, uh, uh, raccoons, skunks, and bats. Uh, largely campaigns to vaccinate household pets have, have been effective. And so now the goal is to stop the spread of rabies through vaccinating wild animals. And why do we wanna stop the spread? Well, not only does rabies kill so many people annually, um, while we have a vaccine for rabies, it's extremely expensive and there's not good diagnostic tech. So if you get bit by a wild animal, 
there's no good diagnostic test to say, were you exposed to rabies unless you also can test the animal itself? Um, in which case, those vaccines can be cost prohibitive. Sometimes they're limited in availability. Getting the vaccine is guaranteed that you won't uh, succumb to rabies. But if you don't get the vaccine, um, either because you don't realize you had contact, uh, we don't have a cure for rabies. So if it progresses to rabies, that's bad news. Um, and so there's this, this large campaign by the US Department of Ag Agriculture that every year deploys 9 million vaccine bait traps across the Eastern US seaboard in order to help mitigate the spread among wild animals. And it's estimated that if we can uh, vaccinate 30% of our wild animal population, that's going to stop the spread locally. And if we can get up to 60%, we can eliminate rabies from the area. And these, these bait traps are small. They're, you know, they fit in the size of your hand. So here's uh, one of these baits uh, in, in a glove next to, next to a quarter. So they're very small. And so it is something that potentially we could have robots deliver. Robots are not currently delivering this. And in fact, right now, uh, they're being delivered by low flying planes in rural areas and helicopters over suburban neighborhoods. So right now this campaign for vaccine delivery is uh, kind of expensive in the machinery that we're using. And so uh, as one instantiation of our resource delivery, could we distribute this among a bunch of robots who can carry this tiny vaccine payload and then deliver these vaccines. So, um, and perhaps this is a cutesy example, but again, we have these robots and they might be carrying different vaccine types. So bats need a different vaccine than raccoons and, and skunks. And each one may have some different capacity. And as they go through the environment, we want to account for the fact that the supply of their uh, resources, in this case, the vaccines is going to, to dwindle and hopefully as we deliver these vaccines, as we deliver um, these resources, we also want to account for the fact that uh, we aren't going to maybe continue to have demand for that. And so we're going to take the approach of a heterogeneous coverage control um, for this. So we're going to utilize properties of the Voronoi tessellation to provide Voronoi-based coverage uh, to our different demand peaks. And each agent is then going to minimize some locational cost. So this looks very similar to some of the move to centroid policies that we might've seen um, in common Voronoi-based coverage control. And in particular, some recent work that we just presented at IROS shows that when we have a moving and dynamic demand, that our approach is input to state stable with the evolving demand in the environment, which means that our robots can keep up and deliver supplies to this demand um, that, that moves and grows and evolves throughout the environment. This, this problem is, is very uh, related to resource allocation problems uh, and task allocation problems, um, as well as heterogeneous coverage control uh, that looks at how can we have robots cover multiple different um, densities or distributions. Traditionally, heterogeneous coverage control looked at different types of sensors. So it's looking at perhaps you have a camera sensor and a temperature sensor, and you want to cover two different distributions with that. Whereas in contrast here, we're looking at using those uh, coverage functions to approximate the demand of resource, the expectation that a resource is needed at a particular location. And we're also going to uh, draw inspiration from dynamic task allocation as well as some routing and scheduling. But instead of trying to think of each particular task and trying to do some optimization over time of all agents to all locations, we're treating that demand instead as a, a density function where there's maybe some uncertainty about where all that demand might be and how we can uh, cover that over time. And so what we do is for every robot, we consider that the robot might have different types of supplies. And in this case, we're illustrating an example where there are two different types of supplies that the robot might have. And we're displaying in this number here, the number of resources of a particular type 
that each robot carries. And then we're going to create demand locations. We're going to represent our demand as Gaussian uh, distributions with some peak at, at some known, known center. And each demand location might have a demand of one or more resources. So this peak location up here has only a demand of this first type of resource. This one only has the demand of the second type of resource. And the middle one has a demand of both resources. And this is something that we can learn and approximate over time. And so we then partition the space by assigning partitions to each demand peak. So for those three demand peaks here, we generate three distinct Voronoi tessellations um, of the environment. And robots participate in a Voronoi partition if they have the resource that corresponds to that demand peak. So in this example, in this green peak here, we're only uh, considering robots that have the second resource type. So you can see not every robot participates in the second Voronoi partition because not every robot has the second resource type. And what we'll also note is that robots can participate in multiple Voronoi partitions. And so then we have this challenge that we have all of these robots participating in um, different, uh, different partitions and now trying to do coverage and, and, and move to some locationally optimal uh, point across these, these multiple partitions. And what does this look like? So what this looks like is we have robots and they might be participating in multiple demands. And even though they might have you know, multiple, if you're familiar with uh, the Voronoi-based move to centroid, they might be pulled towards maybe multiple centroids. Uh, but it turns out we can still write the locational cost as the summation of those, those different locations and solve for the policy that uh, minimizes that locational cost. And further, we eventually converge to a static configuration, assuming nothing else about the demand is changing. So here, what we're showing is where the demand peaks are not changing. So the demand is remaining stationary over time. We're not changing the demand. And we see the robots are able to reach some uh, configuration where they're all uh, distributed amount of different peak, uh, around the different peaks. And we're then supplying those uh, demand peaks with the resources that we have. So I'll briefly go through our formulation. And so what we imagine is that for each demand, there's some demand density based on that, that supply and demand. And so for each of these robots, given that density, we can compute their analogous mass and centroid for each of the Voronoi partitions that they participate in. And this is very similar to uh, previous work in Voronoi-based coverage control. And from that mass and centroid, we can compute a locational cost, which looks at over all the resource types, over all the, the Voronoi partitions that they participate in, it's this uh, minimization of your distance of the robot, the distance of the robot to its corresponding centroids for each of the cells that it's participating in. So if a robot is participating in just one Voronoi partition, it's going to look like a more traditional move to centroid coverage control. If it's participating in, in multiple partitions, it's going to try and uh, move through, uh, kind of move to the location that minimizes that distance between all, all its different centroids. And what I will say is that there's some really nice recent work uh, out of uh, Edgerstedt's group that shows that we can solve this in a decentralized fashion using control Lyapunov functions and control barrier functions. And while I don't have time to go through the full math of how we might solve this, I can briefly highlight that given this locational cost where we're trying to move our robots to all these different um, demand peaks, we can solve this as uh, write this optimization out where we're minimizing for some control policy U, uh, a form that <laughs> looks very messy here. Uh, and, and what this, this does is it, it creates a control Lyapunov function. I wanna refer folks to a really nice paper out of ACC 2019 by Gennaro Notomista and Magnus Edgerstedt, 
on constraint driven coordinated control of multi robot systems, where they derive how to set up uh, the CLF CBF approach. And this is what we're using to uh, solve for our policies for the robots to move and minimize this locational cost. Um, what is also nice about this approach is that given robots are participating in multiple Voronoi partitions, uh, that means that sometimes robots are going to have overlapping cells with other robots, meaning that we can also encode certain collision avoidance constraints. We can also encode some of the other safety features of the robots within this, this formulation. And so I'll briefly mention what our supply and demand dynamics are before going into some simulations. And so what we're assuming when we say that our demand can move, we're saying that the peaks of our demand functions uh, can move over time. So if we have a peak centered at some location mu sub j, that can physically move over time. We can also inject uh, new demand into the system. So that means that the, the mass of that peak or the quantities at that peak can grow over time. And as we deliver supplies, then there should also be some depletion of, of the demand over time. And what's important to note here is that while we can make assumptions on the form of the injection, uh, it's really just our supply function that we're designing within this problem. And our experiments show that under certain conditions for the injection of new demand, as well as our supply function, that allows us to guarantee this input to state stability. And so what we propose is a model of depletion that depends on your location or proximity to these different demand peaks. And what that looks like is as robots get closer to a location of demand, then their rate of delivery of those resources is, is going to increase. And now in this, um, what we're assuming is, you know, we're using these Voronoi cells as an approximation of the expectation of the events occurring over time. And what we're saying is that a robot can cover those event occurrences that come up in their Voronoi cell uh, as they're happening. And so this is really just approximating the, the service rate of, of those events from a robot through here. And, and we show that, you know, given a bounded injection of demand, that this is input to state stable. And further, this can handle uh, coverage of certain demands uh, better than other types of maybe persistent monitoring or lawnmower patterns uh, of robots that might just be doing some sort of static patrol. And so on the left, we have our approach where we have these two demand peaks that are moving over time, the demand is growing, uh, and our robots are adapting and you can see the Voronoi tessellation. Um, we're just plotting one of the two Voronoi tessellations here is, is evolving with the peaks as they, that they move through the demand. Whereas on the, on the right, we compare it to a baseline where we have the robots following some lawnmower trajectory. And in the color uh, scheme that we see, um, we see that uh, our robots, are able to maintain kind of uh, a consistent and serve the level of demand. But as the peaks are moving over here, we see that the robots are not able to keep up with this growing and evolving demand as illustrated by the more green and yellow colors that appear through the video. And over uh, randomized simulations, what we see is that if the demand is moving but not injected, that our coverage policy quickly meets the demand um, on the system and services all the demand with the supply on the robots. Whereas some of these other types of uh, this lawnmower pattern is going to be a lot slower. It does eventually serve all the demand, um, but it's much slower uh, to meet the demand. And, and finally, once we start adding injected demand into the system, uh, at this point in time, we start injecting demand. So the demand is going to also grow over time in addition to the depletion from our supply delivery. And we see an initial recovery period uh, from our robots adjusting to this new demand and then eventually settling down where they're keeping up with the new demand as it's added um, over time, whereas something like a lawnmower pattern is unable to keep up the demand and the demand continues to grow. 
And so we're really excited uh, to kind of see this heterogeneous coverage applied to resource delivery problems and, and resource allocation. We also ran experiments at the in our lab at Boston University where we show uh, these, these ground robots, these Agile X limos um, following and uh, maintaining coverage of, of different um, densities or different demand densities over time. And I started the talk by saying that we want more flexible models of behavior, more complex models of behavior, and then have just spent the last 10 minutes or so talking about a very geometric policy uh, where, where we assume a lot about the different agents. And just to kind of tease some new results that we're um, working on, we're also looking at how these robots can adapt to, uh, to their team online. And so some of our, our work that's under review right now that I hope I'll be able to share more about soon is this idea that if we have these robots delivering resources, uh, there's this idea that as events come up, they, we assume that the robots in our prior work are able to cover it. But what if a robot gets inundated with requests? What if a robot actually can't keep up with the demand that it's supposed to service over time? And so we're looking now at assessing a reputation among our team. So the question is, is can we assess the performance of our teammates based on what they say they'll be able to handle versus their actual performance? So are they actually servicing all the demand that's coming up as it's coming in? And then if our teammates are maybe falling behind or maybe we're performing relatively better than them, can we then use properties of weighted Voronoi tessellations to adjust for these, these changes in reputation. And so in, in coming work and what I hope we'll be able to talk about more broadly soon is we've now switched from those continuous density functions to discrete events that are coming up. So now we're actually looking at discrete um, resource uh, delivery tasks and robots are given a set of events that come up and they start to create tours to then go visit all of those events. And what we see in this video is that some robots are very fast and some robots are slow. So we've designed a team of robots where some are just going to be a little bit worse than others. And over time, the teammates will compare their performance, compare how they're doing, how they're meeting their demand versus the other teammates and start to adjust uh, their cells over time, start to, start to make modifications, both in modifications to the estimate of where these events are occurring. So it could be that we had a bad estimate of our density functions and we need to update that. And it could be a modification of our Voronoi tessellation to start to account for these variations within the team. Um, so we're, we're hoping to share more details about this soon, um, but this is uh, kind of teasing some of the directions where we're moving, where even within these very geometric policies, even where we are assuming all the robots are playing by some base rules, that we still want to look at uh, variations in behavior and nuances within the team and how we might be able to adapt to differences or variations um, within the team. But that's kind of where we'll we'll stop on geometric policies. And one downside of, of these geometric policies is they do assume a lot about the cooperation of the team. They assume a lot about knowing where everything is. And in the next part of a talk, I'd like to think about this notion that maybe we don't explicitly communicate with the other robots in our team. And instead, what if we can only estimate or predict what they might do? And so the question is, is how do we reason about the beliefs of other agents? So if some agent has some uh, representation, some belief about the world and what another agent is, how do we also reason about the fact that that agent has its own beliefs 
about the world and us. And this is some work uh, that came out in TRO about two years ago now on stochastic dynamic games. And in this work, we want to combine belief space planning, that certainty about yourself and the environment, that representation of the world is not everything is deterministic, not everything is known for sure, and combine that with other techniques in game theory uh, where you have this interactive model of uh, your actions can influence the actions of other agents and, and so forth. And we present a game theoretic belief space, ILQG, in our first paper. And what we were excited to find was that by combining this notion of uncertainty and this notion that we can do information gathering to reduce our uncertainty or take actions to increase uncertainty, we get uh, new types of behaviors like hiding, revealing, and seeking information that will also influence our uh, the other agent's actions. In this approach, we're going to formulate our belief space with Gaussian belief dynamics. And we are going to find the Nash equilibrium for our game uh, to solve for both our agent policies and approximate what the other agents are going to do. So let me give uh, kind of an illustrative example of what we mean by this. So imagine we have two agents. We have this blue agent, and the blue agent's objective is to gain information about the orange agent. The orange agent is not cooperative. All it wants to do is maintain a certain velocity and not collide with the blue agent. And we also have this model where we can take measurements. And in certain light sources, uh, light sources are going to reduce the uncertainty the blue agent has about the or orange agent. And so we find in this game as emergent behavior that when you encode both these interaction dynamics between uh, trying to gain information and not colliding, as well as this notion that there are regions of the environment that can reduce the uncertainty, then what we find is the blue agent will then exploit the orange agent's collision avoidance to push them into the light and reduce the uncertainty about the system. And, and we can create different topologies. So here in the simulations, gray are regions of high uncertainty and white are those areas of the light source where we can reduce uncertainty. And with our uh, game theoretic belief space planning approach, we see that this blue agent is going to herd the orange agent and exploit that collision avoidance to follow through the light source. And if we didn't have this model for information gathering, then we would see that the blue agent wouldn't interact with the orange agent and, and wouldn't uh, herd, herd that orange agent. And so it doesn't, it doesn't fully exploit that. So now I'll briefly give an overview of what this game theoretic belief space planning looks like and then go through um, some more examples of, of how we've used it. So in our formulation, we use Gaussian belief dynamics and an EKF to update our beliefs based on both our dynamics and measurement models. We create a game theoretic ILQR where on the forward pass, we're going to roll out our belief dynamics and linearize those dynamics and quadricize the rewards. And then on the backwards pass, at every time step, we're first going to formulate a Q function, solve for some quadratic game, which, which is the policies of, of both agents by minimizing those Q functions and propagate those value functions backwards. And we repeat one and two until we converge to a Nash equilibrium. So in this case, that Nash equilibrium is where no agent can unilaterally change its policy to improve upon its cost. What is really exciting about this formulation is that these policies then are linear in the feedback policies and predictions with a linear complexity in the time horizon, which allows us to perform these updates in these games at approximately 50 Hertz. So for these two agent games, we have uh, really fast computations that get us really interesting and complex dynamics. Uh, this also works in cooperative games. And so in this cooperative game, uh, in this example, we have this guide dog who is tethered to a blind person. And we're using these analogies to say that the blind person can only observe accelerations and doesn't directly 
update their uncertainty, but the guide dog is going to be the agent that reduces the uncertainty of both itself and the person that it's guiding. The guide dog is tethered to the blind person and needs to guide the person to some goal location, but once they arrive at that goal location, they need to arrive with some minimized uncertainty. And so, as well as avoiding sudden accelerations. And so what we see is that under this information gathering game theoretic approach, the guide dog is going to choose a path that goes through the different light sources and gets that uh, blue agent to the goal with a reduction in their uncertainty. And without belief space planning, um, what we see is the guide dog would just go straight to the goal location, but not really reduce that uncertainty. So if you're not considering how the beliefs evolve over time, it would simply move um, to the goal location and not have this reduction in uncertainty, which means that that agent might not actually be able to identify that they've reached the goal location. And while these look like maybe toy examples or simple illustrations, uh, what I will say is that we can also show that this scales up to much more complex games. And so we looked at a competitive racing example where we have two cars on a racetrack. There are regions along the racetrack, which we've illustrated in green, that can reduce the uncertainty. These might be light sources. These might be other areas of the racetrack. And then any sort of dramatic control efforts, acceleration, braking, and steering are going to increase the uncertainty. We're going to compare our policy against um, two different types of planners. So first is a planner that uses belief-based planning, but not game-theoretic planning. And the second is a game-theoretic MPC, but uses no belief-based planning. And we show that the combination of considering both the game-theoretic plus the belief-based model means that we win 44% more races versus a belief-based planning policy alone with no game theory, and 33% more races over one that uh, has just the MPC game theoretic, but no belief space planning. And further, uh, we see some emerging behaviors come up in our game. So we see things like cutting in front of other cars, blocking, so the orange car swerving to prevent the purple car from, from passing. And we also enable things like overtaking. So with information gathering, the purple agent would be able to reduce its uncertainty to a high enough degree in order to competently uh, navigate past the orange car and overtake the orange car. Whereas without information gathering, the uncertainty might be too high where the agent can't confidently um, uh, pass that other car. And so we're, we're really excited by this, this formulation because this is now starting to create really complex and rich interactive models. We can exploit that game theoretic planning where we have these interactions between agents where they're influencing each other's behaviors while also taking into account this notion of how uncertainty can change and how we can gather information um, within the environment. And I mentioned that this approach has some very nice properties being linear in time horizon and linear in the feedback. Uh, but unfortunately, the complexity is not conducive to lots of agents. So in fact, with the number of agents, the complexity is something like it's polynomial, it's something like end of the seventh with the number of agents. So some of our more recent work has asked, how can we scale this to lots of agents. And we're not to lots of agents yet, we're to a few more agents now. But the question is, is how do we take these rich nuanced policies and start to really scale them up and really get to a lot more agents? And so this work uh, is some new work on doing what we call selective negotiations. We're excited to present it um, at the upcoming Multi-Robot Symposium co Conference in Boston this December. And the idea is, is that in these dynamic games, it may be that you don't need to negotiate with all agents at all point in times. And in fact, some agents might not care what you're doing. And if you have these asocial agents, then it's better to just treat them like dynamic obstacles. 
and not negotiate with them. And if you can choose who you negotiate with over time, um, then by choosing these selective negotiations, you can actually uh, kind of scale to more agents without increasing the complexity of your, your planning. And so under this approach, we're going to create this new type of agent. We're going to call them an asocial agent. And the asocial agents are those that don't participate in game theoretic planning. And so for our ego agent, uh, when it's calculating its control policies, when it's going through this, this optimization, they're going to ignore negotiations with asocial agents to reduce their planning version. Now, they're not going to pretend they don't exist in the environment. They're going to treat them more like dynamic obstacles. They're going to say the asocial agent is locked into some control policy that they cannot influence. Therefore, there's no reason to iterate over um, some optimization to a Nash equilibrium. And I'll also point out that asocial agents are not intrinsic to the type of agent. And in fact, we can toggle whether an agent is asocial or not over time based on proximity and objective. So uh, we present a few possibilities of how we might, might change that. So trivially, uh, we can now encode dynamic obstacles as, as asocial agents. So in this case, we have kind of a simple uh, obstacle avoidance game where the green agent and the red agent need to get to their goal locations. But to do so, they first need to pass through a light source and reduce their uncertainty. And we have these black circles that are obstacles within the environment. And so instead of uh, computing some complex negotiation with those obstacles, which are just moving on rails, are not going to change their behavior based on the agents. Uh, we're going to treat them as asocial agents, and then we don't need to do a full iterative planning um, over, over those. And now I mentioned that under the full stochastic dynamic games approach, it was something like a runtime of n to the seventh with the number of agents. And with this, uh, now what we're doing is we are reducing the complexity slightly. So now that complexity is going to be n to the sixth, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's n to the sixth of social agents participating in the interaction. Um, and so it turns out it's also reducing the total n that we're considering, as well as reducing an order off that polynomial. And I will say that some work under review that um, I won't be sharing today is we're further looking how to get that down to n to the fourth through some clever techniques of modifying our belief propagation. So we're starting to reduce the complexity in computation, which is going to give us an ability to start to scale up to a lot of agents. And we, we show this in a, in a couple position swapping games. And the question is, is if you start to uh, change these negotiations, change who you're interacting with, is this going to change your performance? And so in this game, we have these agents that need to move uh, along this tight corridor and get to their different goal locations. And our ego agent in red needs to swap positions with the green and the blue agent, and it never interacts with the, the yellow agent. <laughs> so we see uh, down here, we're plotting the distance over time to each of these agents, um, as well as their trajectories. And now what we propose is you can start to do these selective negotiations by simply choosing the nearest neighbors. And so here, what we're plotting is in black, we're showing that this agent is sort of toggled off. We're not negotiating with that agent. And so at first we're gonna negotiate with our two agents. It's going to change over time, which agents we negotiate with. Um, and doing this, uh, speeds up the planning uh, approximately 10% per iteration. So this is a pretty nice speed up simply by removing one agent. And we can go a step further and we can say that maybe we'll just negotiate with our nearest neighbor in this game. And then we get a speed up uh, per iteration in the game of up to 20% uh, or more. And we see that the trajectories really aren't changing over time. Um, that trajectory of that ego agent, that red agent, is really not changing over time. And 
uh, and comparing the full planning case with the nearest neighbor case, there's very minimal um, change to the performance, and yet we're seeing a pretty significant change in the computation that's needed in the, the runtime. And so we're excited to see this as kind of those first steps towards scaling up our dynamic games through these selective negotiations. And we're excited to continue exploring this and, and see where this goes in, in future research. Um, before I jump into my final section, I just wanna ask, uh, how are we doing on time? How much time? Um, as you wish, I think you're perfectly on time, but if you wanna take a few extra minutes to to explain okay. something else, feel free to take them. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll then quickly talk about kind of the final uh, topic, which is social behaviors for autonomous vehicles. And so this is um, some work in, in trying to figure out how we can model human teammates. And a challenge with human teammates is that they're not going to necessarily make optimal decisions. It's hard to predict their behavior. They don't communicate like other robots. And in general, humans are, are pretty selfish. And this is important um, in the context we looked at this is in the context of a social dilemma, which is that if you have an autonomous vehicle that needs to make that unprotected left turn with a human uh, in cross traffic, how do you know if the human is going to yield and let you make that turn versus uh, you should wait until after the human passes? And so what we propose is social value orientation is some way to disambiguate this behavior. Now, social value orientation is a concept from social psychology where you compare the reward to yourself versus a reward to another. So in this classic experiment where people are asked to split $100 with a stranger, if you give all $100 to that stranger, the reward to other is uh, completely reward to other, no reward to self, that's considered altruistic. And we represent that as this angular notation of pi over two. If you were to split it 50-50, that would be pro-social. We can represent it as this angular notation B equals pi over four. And finally, if you were to keep all $100, you've maximized your reward self, no reward other, and that's entirely an egoistic um, action. And so using social value orientation, uh, we propose that this will help us disambiguate those social dilemma situations. If we can assess an SVO of another person, then maybe we can assess whether they're going to be the altruistic driver that yields or the egoistic driver uh, that doesn't yield. And so we take uh, this SVO and we use it to weight our uh, reward policies between ourselves and other agents in these games. And then we can still create a best response game where each agent maximizes its individual utility it's solved for the Nash equilibrium of those games. And in this case, uh, when we talk about these reward functions, we did learn our reward function on the NGSIM data set, but I won't uh, necessarily go in, into that in full detail. And so this utility maximizing policy with SVO uh, is instead of doing an individual reward where we would just look at our reward over some horizon, we're going to weight our reward and another agent's reward by the relative SVO. And so we can still calculate some utility over some time horizon as the summation of those rewards and find a control policy for the agents that maximizes that utility. But here that particular utility maximizing policy inherently has some notion of your reward and the other agent's reward. So if you have two initial trajectories that are in conflict, so these two agents might uh, be intersecting, for an egoistic agent, that's the same as doing an individualistic uh, control policy, and they're not necessarily going to change their behavior. But an altruistic agent uh, is going to be one that might dramatically change their trajectory, uh, giving full priority to the other agent's individual trajectory. What was really exciting is that when we go back to our data and we look at how this can improve trajectory predictions in the NGSIM data set, simply by including SVO within our model, improved our predictions of these other driver trajectories 
by uh, 25%. And what I'll note is that SVO is not a static property. We actually allow it to, to vary over time. So we're estimating SVO online based on two seconds of history from those trajectories and matching it with the most likely SVO that explains those trajectories. And we see that in this case, when this purple car needs to merge as the lane is ending, it's going to become more competitive. And uh, conversely, this green car, which sort of eases up to create a gap to let the purple car in, is exhibiting more pro-social towards altruistic behavior. And then as soon as that purple car is merged, it kind of speeds up and closes the gap and prevents any further cars. And so it's a nice sanity check to show that in merging versus non-merging situations, we do see that merging ve vehicles are more competitive than non-merging vehicles, uh, which is something we expect. If you've got to make a merge, you've got to sort of act a little bit more aggressively before the lane ends. And we can then take this to simulations with, with autonomous vehicles, where if we have some autonomous vehicle and all the other cars are egoistic, the autonomous vehicle needs to wait for all those cars to pass before its lane, lanes ends and then will fall in line behind. But if those drivers are pro-social, uh, it might detect that they're going to actually create a gap and it's safe to go ahead and merge within the gap. And so instead of this conservative behavior of waiting for everyone to pass, uh, if we can predict that these are pro-social drivers, then we can predict that it's safer to, to make this, this maneuver. And while in this illustration with only four cars, maybe that doesn't seem like a lot, when we start to think about cars operating in dense traffic, it's these sorts of behaviors that we need for autonomous vehicles to really scale to our everyday urban driving environments. And we can also show in simulation with the unprotected left turn too, if we detect that we have an altruistic driver approaching, then we know it's safe uh, to make that turn across traffic. And, and we can recognize that cue that they're yielding to let us let us make that turn. And so uh, I wanna thank you all for listening to my talk and letting me run a few minutes over. Um, in summary, I shared uh, some, of, some of our work, both from sort of a geometric perspective of cooperation through multi-robot resource delivery, as well as these more interactive or game theoretic models looking at how we can build up uh, game theory with beliefs-based planning and start to scale that up through selective negotiations, as well as incorporating models of social uh, psychology into our utility maximizing and game theoretic policies to create more nuanced behavior. And really looking forward, you know, I believe that enabling these rich complex interactions that we see in our agents is going to require multifaceted models of behavior. So I don't think any one particular approach is, is kind of the only approach that we need to pursue. I think it's the combination of all of these that is really exciting um, going forward in time. And, and kind of as a final slide, I really wanna think that this work uh, was done with the help of many collaborators. Um, I've worked with some amazing people uh, through through the years. And so I want to quickly acknowledge um, the co-authors uh, and, and collaborators from the work in this talk, as well as the different funding sources um, that I've had. And so thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Alyssa. Very interesting talk. I think... Um... Yeah, if anyone in the public has, uh, in the audience has questions, can simply unmute their self and uh, ask question or write it in the chat. Okay. Uh, Ali, if you don't mind, I'll go first. I have a go, go, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Alisa. You know, first of all, uh, it's very nice. I mean, it reminds me of a lot of the work that I've been doing over the decades. Um, and the, but uh, you know a couple of things resonate well with a lot of the things that uh, with some of the things that we have been doing recently. Um, can you go back, um, you know, to the uh, to the game where you um, uh, essentially simplify the the problem by only looking at the nearest neighbor? Uh, yeah. Um, so I think it was, was this a, just game. before. The... 
Right, 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 right. Yeah. So, yeah, I was wondering. So, I I definitely understand that uh, you want to reduce the complexity, right? But, and uh, you know, when we are in traffic with dozens of vehicles around us, uh, not necessarily we are looking at all of them, right? So probably there is one or two cars that influence what we do, right? But um, would there be other ways of choosing your um, uh, the other players in your game, right? So, because you know, I understand that you want to deal with the nearest agent, but for example, in traffic, probably you you worry more about people who are in front of you rather than people who are behind you, right? So even though they may not be necessarily the nearest agents, right? So you thought a little bit about how different ways that you can partition this game in a sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that's a that's a great great point. And so, for so so I will say that this is our kind of first conference paper on these selective negotiations, and we're we're looking more at at other paradigms. So we present nearest neighbor as one example. Um, but I agree that in traffic, uh, if you're like in a highway driving situation, your nearest neighbor might be the cars in the adjacent lanes, but the car most relevant to your safety is likely the car directly in front of you, not necessarily your nearest neighbors. Uh, so I think there's other ways you could consider who is is most relevant um, based on the game that you're playing. I also think that if you start to know more about like the actions that you're taking, so if you're in the car and you need to change lanes, um, then you're going to care more about negotiating with the agents in that adjacent lane. And maybe you can consider the agents. And if you're turning into a left lane, then, and you're, you, there's multiple lanes, then maybe over on the right, uh, you don't have those. And I want to clarify that even though we're talking about negotiations with the agents and the the other agents in the environment, we're still tracking through our uh, kind of belief update or our EKF. So while we're not negotiating um, or trying to predict the influence of our decisions on how their policy changes, we're not totally neglecting their existence. So we'll still see them mm. in the world. Um, so it's not like we're saying this doesn't exist, now this exists and having dramatic fluctuations. But I think uh, more generally to your point, um thinking about the the different ways in which we can maybe understand the game and understand who we need to negotiate with is a very interesting problem okay uh, thank you and then the other question that i had was on the social behavior yeah um uh, right it it may be the case that some people are altruistic sometimes or tend to be altruistic, but maybe on a day they're in a rush and they're not very altruistic, right? So, yeah. <laughs> uh, how do you, um, or also you can make people, you know, you were saying that people who are merging are more competitive, right? And also people who are dealing with somebody who is about to merge have to become more altruistic so in a sense yeah. here you are you are being made more or less altruistic so your social value in a sense is affected by the situation you're in right uh you're in a rush or not or you are in a merge and you're coming up to the to the end of the of the merging lane right and the, yeah uh, you had to do something right yeah um and also you can end by doing something you are kind of forcing the other guy to be more socially oriented, more altruistic, or else suffer dire consequences, right? So yeah, it can be very selfish, but if we crash, um, you know, there's no point in you being very selfish, right? So yeah, uh, yeah. But for both of us, right? So I, I am just wondering, you know, how what you've seen in terms of on one hand, you know, like a time variability of the social value orientation, right? Or or how you can actually affect somebody else or, you know, how actually your own social value orientation can be affected by the circumstances and can be artificially affected by somebody else, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I will say that 
in our analysis on data, we didn't assume SVO was fixed and in fact could vary over time. And so it's we do allow it to change based on, um, you know, we're not trying to predict exactly what the drivers were thinking in this data set, but that uh, instead of hard coding that this driver is altruistic or trying to say that this driver is altruistic all the time, we didn't observe that. We saw that, you know, different interactions caused different fluctuations in SVO. Um, we haven't been able to study, although I think it would be a fascinating study to see what influences people to change their driving behavior based on other factors, because I think that would be kind of an interesting thing to say. I'm going to, if, if I see a driver get cut off, for instance, then that would tell me that that driver in subsequent in interactions might be a little bit, you know, angry that they were cut off. And so maybe they're going to be a little bit more selfish over some cooling down period or even knowing things like this driver is in a hurry or this driver is late for work. So they're probably going to be more selfish. Um, I think it's, it, and, and I think even beyond that, SVO is not the only type of behavior model that we could use to build out a complex model of human behavior. So I think SVO is somewhat perpendicular to things like uh, other traditional metrics that we've seen sort of in, in terms of like riskiness. So SVO isn't necessarily, I mean, selfish and, and altruistic are, are you going to yield or not yield? Whereas riskiness might be, what is your comfort of how close you'll get to another vehicle? And so I think you could also develop maybe multifaceted models of of personality that have, you know, you have some, some SVO score, and then you also have a riskiness score, and you could have an attentiveness score. And all of those things together um, could create a really, a really rich model of behavior. Uh, I don't think I answered all of your questions. So um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, I was not meant to, you know, elicit an answer. Uh, I think that you yeah. know, these are some of the things that we are also thinking about, and uh, so yeah. I just wanted to, yeah, uh, pick your brain. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. Uh, I will also point to some work that was done by a colleague after. So this was work um, that I did during my postdoc um, in Daniela Russo's lab at at Seasdale and a colleague, uh, Noam Buckman, did some subsequent work. Uh, we, we did a few other, other papers looking at different types of applications to SVO, um, but he, he has a nice paper where he looks at um, kind of some pairwise SVO as well. So the notion that instead of just being altruistic or egoistic, that it actually matters with whom you're interacting with. So you you might have a friend that you're pro-social with and you might have uh, somebody else that you're you're a little bit more selfish around. Excellent, thank you, thank yeah. you. Uh, I don't want to take all of your time, but somebody else has other questions. No worries. Uh, it looks like there's maybe a question in the chat. Okay, um, so I'll just read this. Thank you, Alyssa, for sharing. I'm a bit confused about your toy example of the dog and the blind person moving through light areas. The dog's uncertainty would be lowered, right? But it seems in the end of the video through the dog's uncertainty is lower. Its end position is still a little bit far. Um, so how can it guarantee that the blind person can reach the goal? Besides, is the uncertainty model for the position or also the velocity? So thank you for that question. Let me go ahead and find that, that video. Um, and so, in, in this simulation, let me see if I can cut to the end here. So we do have, um, oops, I'm gonna just pause this. So at the end, yeah, I think maybe with the video looping, it didn't look like the, 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 the blind person reached the goal. So we do have actually that as it terminates, it does land in that, that goal location. Um, and we are modeling uncertainty on both the positional uncertainty, which we illustrate as the circles here, as well as uncertainty in the velocity. So it's uncertainty over the entire state, 
uh, which includes our velocity. Um, but uh, we, we just have the position uncertainty illustrated here. Uh, and so what we see in this is that we have the dog and it does move through the light sources. And so even though the person is not moving through the light sources, as the dog moves through the light sources, the corresponding uncertainty for a, the person's position at that point in the trajectory is lowered. Because we have some objectives about avoiding sudden accelerations, we're also trying to calculate a trajectory that's going to smoothly uh, move the blind person there with kind of those, those minimal uh, changes in acceleration. Does that um, answer your question if you're still on the chat? Alisa, may I ask a follow-up question on this? Yeah. So how does this uh, relate to, let's say, the, the nested reasoning in, in beliefs? So usually when you have uncertainty about the position of others and he reason about the uncertainty on yourself and so on, you can have this uh, uh, nested beliefs. Well, here yeah, it I... seems that you just have this kind of joint beliefs on the state of both players. Uh, yeah, so so in terms of um so we in this work uh we specifically stop at first order beliefs. So mm -hmm. we stop here at the I think that you think as the first order. Um although you could formulate uh second order or, or even further nested beliefs that I think that you think that I think that you think um and and go down. So we are uh so that was our our approximation so we 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 formulate it for kind of one one level of nesting not not future um or not kind of further levels down and i think what is uh different about the approaches that look at nested beliefs versus how we've formulated ours is this idea of iterating to solve for a Nash equilibrium. So doing that negotiation back and forth to find um, the particular Nash policy versus maybe just trying to predict how those policies change. So you could certainly consider nested beliefs and take an action and try to predict how that, that changes, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you you iterate until you reach a Nash equilibrium or you're solving for kind of the dynamic game while you're keeping track of those nested beliefs. Does that answer your question? And do you, yes. And do you still need uh, some kind of, uh, say, common prior assumption for this to converge to a Nash equilibrium or? Yes. So we, we also assume that the agents um, are going to construct symmetric beliefs about one another, meaning mm -hmm. that uh, agent I's belief about the world is symmetric with agent J's belief about the world. Um, that's something we're interested in exploring in, in some future work is, is essentially how does that, that break, um, meaning that Clearly, if you have, if, if the beliefs are, you know, and, and we've we've broken, kind of played a little bit with, like they can calculate separate beliefs. So technically it's not truly belief I is equal to belief J, uh, but how much can you break that into, can you start to then exploit creating a false belief for another agent to get them to basically choose the wrong Nash equilibrium um, of a policy because the the convergence to a Nash equilibrium is only under the assumption that they have these these symmetric beliefs. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's an interesting assumption that's worth investigating and seeing that what are the consequences of breaking that assumption. Um, but for now we're we're assuming that there's there's kind of a shared belief or symmetric belief. All right, thank you. Last call, if someone has uh, another question. All right. 
been so quiet. So we'll thank you again, Alyssa. It was a pleasure having you here. Yeah, and thanks. Uh, thanks we'll so much. We'll see you next week for the next episode. Bye-bye.